Good morning and welcome to the new year to the Board of County Commissioners issues and updates with Administrator Gary Schmidt on this January 4, 2023. Gary, what's up first? Thank you, Chair Smith. Welcome board to your first meeting of 2023. Welcome to new County Commissioner Ben West. Welcome to the county. Welcome to the commission. We Thank all you. look forward to working and serving with you. Uh, first item today, Chair, would you please convene as the Water Environment Services Board? I will recess as the Board of County Commissioners and convene as a Water Environment Services. All right, Commissioners, you're now meeting as the Water Environment Services Board. This is a request for consent agenda. Item one, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with the City of Milwaukee for the Kellogg Good Neighbor Program. The agreement value is $920,000 for 4.5 years. Funding is through Water Environment Services, Sanitary Sewer Operating Funds. No county general funds are involved. Greg Geist is the Director of Water Environment Services. Right from the start, I'm gonna ask that we actually pull this item. However, I do want Greg to explain the background of this. Have any, hear any questions you may have, but then we, I do ask we bring this back to a future business meeting, not this Thursday. But, but still, Greg, if you could explain the background and hear commissioner comments, thank you. Uh, thank you, Gary. Good morning, Chair Smith and commissioners. Uh, this is an agreement that we've had with Milwaukee since 2012, um, where we pay them essentially $1 per what we call an EDU or a household per month uh, that goes into a good neighbor fund to be used for projects uh, around the facility. Um, we, a couple years ago, we also entered into an uh, IGA, good neighbor IGA with uh, Oregon City and Gladstone. And uh, we shared that with Milwaukee and they requested that we have a similar uh, arrangement. So basically the, the dollars stay the same. Um, we would transfer the, the balance, which is about $300,000 uh, that we have been kind of acting as the city's bank uh, where we put the money, we keep the money, we send the money to them when they have projects that are qualified. Um, so really what, what this is, is an administrative change. Um, and uh, we did make a mistake. Uh, there's a reference in the recital to in a, attachment A uh, that includes a map of the geographic area that would be eligible for these funds, um, in a, which is also similar to what we did with Oregon City and Gladstone. So you have a co hard copy of that map, um, but uh, my apologies, it did not get. We are looking at this map, Greg, and in the proposed Good Neighbor program areas that are outlined in pink. Yes, that's and the one. What do you plan to do with the pink area? Well, so the funds can be. Those are our riparian areas along Johnson Creek, Kellogg Creek, Minthorn Springs, Minthorn Creek, um, and so. What the agreement allows is for projects within that geographic area that provide improved <laughs> recreational opportunities such as pathways, parks, and trails, uh, enhance fish and wildlife habitat and riparian areas, create opportunities for collaboration and leverage resources between city and west related to another purpose approved by the parties, uh, enhance public knowledge on wastewater treatment and surface water management, essentially. Uh, the other thing I should I need to make sure to mention is of that 100, approximately $137,000 a year that, that goes to the city, about 63% of that is used for debt service on the Milwaukee Bay Park improvements that were made. Okay, now wait a minute. <clears throat> You're saying, Mr. Savas, that we're getting money for creek restoration because there's issues with the creeks that are outlined in this map is how much again 167,000 a year 137 137 excuse me 137 a year and that is going for debt service on Milwaukee Bay Park 63 percent of it is and that's that's been happening since well since the park was completed and, and because it was such a significant amount of the funds we did bring it to the board and said is this okay that just like smells to me Commissioner Savas yeah <clears throat> so Back when I first came on as a commissioner in 2011, um, there was a lawsuit between the city of Milwaukee and Clackamas County. I remember that. And that had gone on for years. As a matter of fact, the dispute was 25 year old dispute. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, mayor Ferguson at the time, the mayor at the Ferguson at the time, and I had a conversation and tried to learn about this. And at that time, Chair Peterson, Lynn Peterson of the Clackamas County Commission and the board assigned me to work on this issue. 
Um, and I asked our legal staff to bring in all the documents, and they brought in literally boxes of documents, you know, in my office. And I, I realized, oh my gosh, this is ridiculous. Long story short, I won't, won't belabor this, but long story short is that we uh, worked for about a year and a half on putting, crafting together an agreement mm -hmm. to mitigate the direct impacts of the facility to the nearby neighborhood and whatnot. That was that was to, to help to help for that. That was the purpose of that of that good neighbor. It's a good neighbor fund. We set that up. The document was signed, I believe, in December of 2012. I roughly believe, and um, that was the that was the purpose of that. And it seems a little bit, I'd like to look, look into um, the fact that this kind of touches NCPRD if they're leveraging, you know, a debt or resources for, for that. I don't want to, I'm here to support the principle of what was originally in mm -hmm. place. And I just think that it's not very much money per year, $137,000, but to, to stretch it out over you know, to spread it, the peanut butter so thin over this much of an area, um, I'm just concerned about the balance that is not committed debt service, really not going to mitigate the impacts near the, or in the improvements, whether it's the park or whether it's the neighborhood nearby. But to me, it ought to be spent there. Um, you know, Spring Park, for example, was, was redone. You don't, this is not your district, this is NCPRD. But those dollars could have been assigned to Spring Park. Instead, those are NCPRD. NCPRD dollars were spent on Spring Park, is my understanding. So there should have been an attorney on each side, and there should have been board involvement on, front of, on, on both sides of this. So I don't know about the, this is news to me, also about the Oregon City Agreement as well. I'd like to learn more about that. Um, but uh, I would like to talk to, learn more about these agreements and so forth, but I'm just concerned. Um, I, wanna, I wanna stay with the principle and the agreement that we originally established but this is miles and miles away from a Kellogg treatment plant. In, in, well, it's not maybe a mile, um, but it is in the, in the watershed, and, and that was the, the principle of the agreement. And, and there were, we did involve county council, and the city's council reviewed it. Um, and the, the, the area immediately around the facility is still included, so work can be done there. And to date, um, They've used it to repave the walking path along the, the river. We've spent several hundred thousand in, in planting around the facility, lighting for the pathway, uh, mm -hmm. a number of benches, a number of amenities that are directly adjacent to the, to the facility. Um, and this does expand the geographic area, um, but again, in keeping with our mission and our priorities and <coughs> the work that we do. Couple questions. Is Elk Island a part of this too? Uh, yes, it is. Commissioner Savas, any more comments before I call on other commissioners? Uh, other than it's my, re my request to go along with the uh, staff to uh, pull this for further um, further discussion. Okay, any other commissioners? Commissioners um, Scholl, you're up. Yeah, I just want to make sure this Kellogg Good Neighbor Program it has no impact on the storm water runoff problem that we have, does it? Oh, it could, yes. It they, could? They, they can certainly use so, it too. So approval of this could uh, reduce uh, the, the problem you have of storm water runoff into your storm sewers? Oh, the, no, not uh, okay. if you're talking about inflow yeah, that's, and infiltration. That, that's, okay, I was trying to see if there's no, some we have sort a, of value here with that uh, no, to we have help a, mitigate that problem. Right, we have a separate IGA with the city for specifically for inflow and infiltration. This could help if they wanted to do, um, you know, treat, put in stormwater treatment facilities to, to treat the stormwater before it gets into the creek, um, for example, which improves water quality for the whole community. Okay, well, I look forward to learning more about this. Thank Commissioner you. Schrader. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about this in particular that, um, and certainly I would say that Commissioner Savas has a lot more hands-on experience with this, but I've been trying to get up to speed with you folks. And my notion of WES, it does have a broader, uh, not just sewer treatment, but mm -hmm. water quality functions. So maybe it's helpful for the whole commission to get a list of some of the other restoration work you're doing within 
your network because I think that's important to realize that this isn't specifically necessarily um, one spot. This is actually a major uh, broad function that Wes uh, really does on and they're actually a leader in environmental education, water quality education, uh, and I see this as part of that larger continuum. So if you could just get some more information on a lot of the other projects that are as critically important as this, because having just talked to Chair Smith about <laughs> a stormwater problem that I'm, I'm dealing with in Lake Oswego as a citizen, uh, yeah, I think anything that kind of mitigates water quality is actually going to help any kind of stormwater. Greg, right. is there a time limit on uh, the approval for this? Um, not that I'm aware of. The city has already approved it, so they're just waiting on us at this point. Okay. And I will, if I may, um, so there are the, the kind of the cosmetic or uh, right. amenities around the park, the, the path and the, the tree plantings and the screenings and things like that. But, but as we did with Oregon City and Gladstone, there's also the component of what benefits the community from right. an environmental and water quality standpoint. And that's reflected in the geographic area that we chose both here and for Gladstone and uh, well, $137,000 and 60% goes to pay for the debt. There's not much left over for restoration, paths, or, or whatever. So it's almost, uh, it's almost mute on this. Uh, Commissioner Savas. Yeah, I, again, I want to look at the Oregon City Agreement and the principle upon that. You know, there's, there is one small neighborhood very close to the Tri-Cities plant, for example, right? Um, and, but for the most part, uh, you know, the Island Station neighborhood of Milwaukee and the restaurants across the way, odor, things like that were, one, were part of those good neighbor aspects. And again, I want to make sure that, you know, I, ideally the resources are always there to help that along. And I did, by the way, that the lower left corner is the legend, so just a quick <laughs> deal there. It's, it's a two mile distance, up to two miles here okay. uh, on both ends, whether it's along the Multnomah County border um, and Clackamas County border up at uh, um, Johnson Creek, or whether it's on the map. Right here. Yeah, up that, that, here. That's two, that's two miles from there, okay. there to the plant. Okay. Two miles from there to the plant. Right. So. All, all the same watershed. Oh, I get that. Oh, I get that. Okay, we're going to move on to this. Uh, Gary, let's tee this up for a further discussion, either on a Tuesday or a Wednesday session. I would recommend a policy session with the board so you can have a full discussion. And I'd like uh, County Council to be able to weigh in on this in light, uh, Jeffrey Munns, of other considerations on the Milwaukee Bay Park and Elk Island. Yes. Thank you very much, so, Greg. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Greg. So we are pulling this item from consent. We'll come back to you at a policy session in the coming thank weeks. Thank you, Greg. All right. Uh, Chair, would you please convene as the North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District Board? I will recess as a Water Environment Services and convene as a North Clackamas um, NCP Parks Recreation District. District. Recreation yes. District. Thank I'm you. a little off of being on vacation. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. You're now meeting as the North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District. This is a request for a consent agenda. Item one, approval of a reinstatement of an intergovernmental agreement with Metro to donate district-owned parcels of Mount Talbert Nature Park. Fiscal impact is $1,000 in closing costs. Funding is through Metro. No county general funds are involved. Mike Bork, Director of North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District. Jeff Munns, County Council. Go ahead, please. Thank you. And that's a pretty good summary of all that we're here for is reinstating an IGA, but I'm happy to answer questions. What this is is really the remnants of the unwinding of the relationships with Happy Valley and NCPRD when they left the district. Mount Talbert is in that portion of what was the district in Happy Valley. And so now that Happy Valley is not in NCPRD, these parcels were sort of stranded. Metro took over management of Mount Talbert Nature Park in 2020 under an IGA, but these three small parcels were left out of that transfer. And this is why we're transferring them to Metro. And we had come to you in September to make that happen. Uh, and in the intervening time of getting the authorization to move forward with the donation and, and where we are now, the IGA expired. Uh, in it, through nobody's fault, <laughs> so that's why we need to to get this reinstated so we can finish this up. Commissioner Samus. Yeah. So what what's the acreage of each of those parcels? 
I'm not sure of the each of them, but they total approximately five acres right along uh, Sunnybrook. If they faced that, one of them was a kind of an open space donation uh, when a, 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 parse, a, a portion of the land across Sunnybrook was developed, and this was deeded to the county years ago. Then two of the very small pieces that were taken as part of right of way um, when the road was constructed, kind of that bypass, you know, that, of Sunnybrook, and then deeded back to NCPRD because they were adjacent to Mount Talbert. And so that's the origin of how we got the property. And then it's just because there's these small parcels left over at the fringe of the park, you know. To transfer them to Metro. Yeah, that does that does ring a bell. I do recall part of that, and I'm aware of the that Mount Talbert area to some degree. Um, and that Metro owns the substantial part of the land up there already. Correct. Right, but it's not associated with these five acres. But I do want to say, just as a sidebar for the later conversation, I'm just curious. I just got the thinking last night when I read the packet. Um, how much land? I'm curious how much land Metro owns with open parks bonds within Clackamas County, <clears throat> and this 500 acre land swap issue. Just want to just plant that seed that, you know, what if they just took out their open parks land mm -hmm. and left the neighborhoods alone? You know, I don't know the answer to that, but I think to at, for the conversation, Mount Talbert Nature Park is approximately 190 acres. Right. Yep. Thank you. Interesting question, Paul. Yes. I'm okay with it. See no objections. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Chair, will you now convene as the Board of County Commissioners? I will recess as the North Clackamas Parks and Recreation District and convene as the Board of County Commissioners. All right, you're now meeting as the Board of County Commissioners for the rest of the meeting. Next is request for consent agenda for the regular county agenda. First up, disaster management, item one, approval of an emergency management performance grant agreement with the Oregon Department of Emergency Management. The grant value is $166,327 for one year, funded through the Oregon Department of Emergency Management with a $166,327 match funded through budgeted county general funds. Daniel Nybauer, Director of Disaster Management, go ahead. Good morning, Chair Smith. Commissioners, Administrator Smith, the Emergency Management Performance Grant is a FEMA grant that we get through the Oregon Department of Emergency Management that is allocated in portions to counties and cities for us to perform emergency management uh, activities. We use it to support uh, staff payroll costs uh, okay. through the year. This is a generally an annual recurring year, although we have seen the amount decrease over time. Great. Questions or comments? Mm -hmm. Mr. Shaw? Mm -hmm. This uh, grant uh, will it affect the uh, new uh, Emergency Management Council? Will it affect CPOs? Can you use this, some of this money to help stimulate their CPO involvement in your disaster management planning? It's generally limited to uh, department operations and uh, either staff costs or purchasing equipment or planning projects. Okay. I see no further uh, questions and no objections. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Next, transportation and development. Item one, approval of a public storm drainage easement at Billy Goat County Park with the city of Gladstone. No fiscal impact. No county general funds are involved. Dan Johnson is a director of transportation and development. Go ahead. Good morning, uh, Chair Smith, Commissioners, uh, Commissioner West. Nice to meet you. Um, we are here to talk about um, a storm drainage easement, um, essentially, essentially a storm line. Um, it was determined that the city of Gladstone had a storm line that went through a park um, that we have, that they have maintenance responsibility for. We had a storm event, which caused um, some issues, I think, with some of the abutments uh, to that storm line. The city was going to go in and repair it. Found out they didn't have an easement. This is an, an easement of a whopping 1,800 square feet in size. It's about 15 feet in width, about 124 feet in length. Um, simply authorizes the city to go in there and do work. Has no material impact to the park. Um, the IGA requires they replace, um, once completed, the work is completed, they replace um, any amenities associated with the park back to their original condition. I'd be happy to answer any questions the board may have. Uh, any questions or comments? No objections. Go ahead. All right, item two, approval of a maintenance assistance grant intergovernmental agreement with the Oregon State Marine Board for operation and maintenance funding for five county recreational boating access sites. The grant value is $50,700 with a $19,875 match for two years. <laughs> funding is through the Oregon State Marine Board and county park and boat ramp user fees. No county general <coughs> funds are involved. 
So county parks operates and maintains a number of recreational boating facilities, boating ramps. Essentially, this is funding, grant funding we're looking to secure. Um, the staff report provides the details on what those sources are. Um, I want one point of clarification, I want to make sure we're clear. It talks about the fact that that match comes from park and boat ramp user fees. The match is essentially staff time and material costs that are funded through, and that is one of the funding sources for those services. Um, it doesn't read necessarily correctly in regards to the fact that we're paying money to get money. Um, but essentially, we provide receipts of costs that, um, that meet our match requirement for these particular funds. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item three, approval of a board order and quit claim D, transferring two tax loss to the city of Oregon City. Sale value is $13,887. Funding is through the city of Oregon City. No county general funds are involved. So a little history, um, just basically to make sure we're all on the same page. The Clackamas County Property Management um, deals with foreclosed properties that go through tax foreclosure. So essentially, um, they are in possession of two lots, tax lot 5800 and 5900, okay, which were received from tax foreclosure in 2021. Um, the parcels are approximately three tenths um, and about two tenths of an acre in size. Um, in preparation for the auction process that we put these properties back out on the market, um, essentially we um, coordinate through other public entities to see if there's interest from these public entities to retain these properties for public good or public benefit. Um, these two particular parcels, Oregon City, the city of Oregon City, reached out to us and informed us that they would like to secure those properties. Um, essentially, uh, portions of Trillium Park Drive, where these properties are located, have been experiencing a slow mo moving landslide um, um, since its construction, probably in about 1999 appro approximately. The city has repaired utilities um, and is working to abandon the roadway and acquisition of these properties will help them further mitigate future landslide um, impacts in that area. We've talked to the board and executive session about these properties. They are very steep, limited buildability. Um, there's landslide topography on the sites, um, essentially um, little redevelopment potential for the properties in question. The dollar amount that we're talking about is essentially the taxes that were um, not paid and some administrative costs so we can recoup those costs for our property management group. I'd be happy to answer any questions beyond that. Cost is $13,887, correct? Correct. Any questions or comments? See no objections to this moving forward. Thank you. Item four, approval of a public improvement contract with North Star Electrical Contractors for the Radar Speed Feedback Science Project. Contract value is $349,400. Funding is through House Bill 2017, State House Bill 2017, county road funds. No county general funds are involved. Um, a significant portion of our um, safety efforts is around speed speed radars and detection devices uh, to essentially inform the traveling public of their speed they are going on our particular roadways. This contract will result in the construction of a number of additional um, radar feedback facilities. They're located primarily on Stafford Road in two locations, 282nd and New Era Road. Uh, these have been reviewed um, strategically by our traffic safety group um, for their placement. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah. Hey, Dan. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Good, good to see you. So um, I, I've got this letter from Mayor Buck. I did forward it to Gary. I haven't forwarded it to the rest of you. So could we, I'll make sure that happens. But one of the things that they evidently have an area that I believe is on the edge. It's unincorporated Clackamas County. Um, and they've had speeding problems. And they absolutely loved it when you had this radar there. But then it got moved. So the mayor called me and said, please, God, put it back. <laughs> please, God, put this back. And um, I'm trying to, I'm going to have to get back to him and explain that we don't have a lot of them. OK, but I just wanted to, uh, I'll send the letter just so everybody's aware of the issue that they're having with it. They love these things. If nothing else, it really gives people a reminder to slow down. Are you familiar with the area where I, it was I placed? did receive the letter. I believe um, okay. they were kind enough to policy advisor. Gary was kind enough to forward me the letter, Good. so I saw it. I mean, just, just for the sake of discussion, we have um, a number of these radar signs that are mobile in nature, right. and we have a number of requests that we field throughout right. the county to place these there. 
and so that's why it was there, then it was gone. I'm assuming it was one of those mobile facilities. Yeah, that's what, what it was. What we yep. do have um, underway is our traffic safety group is working to identify additional sites with various funding sources. Okay. Um, and I can at least follow up with them and just see kind of where this ranks on the necessities that we have throughout the county um, and provide you some information so you can contact the mayor and educate him about that. And, and of course, I opened the discussion because I went to one of their meetings and talked about a stormwater problem in my neighborhood. So, no good <laughs> the deed goes saw unpunished. His chance. <laughs> I said, I will bring this message to my colleagues. Uh, so, I'll bring it to you. But if I can even mention that you have a traffic safety group and that they're becoming aware of it, that would at least give them some sense. Yep. yep. I'll follow the, up with uh, Joe Merrick and his group. Yeah, um, that's yeah, his group, absolutely. and they can, they can assess it. Yep. Okay, on the radar, no fun in, pun intended. Okay. Correct. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Commissioner West. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, these are not um, uh, the little robots that do like flash, like speed tickets. No. It's not that, right? <laughs> Correct. Just to they, clarify. Correct. And how do we determine, and these are permanent, these aren't mobile sites, right? I believe I actually e emailed them when we were back in the back to confirm that. I believe these are permanent sites, but I can email the board and confirm that. Um, for this cost and these specific locations, I believe them to be permanent. And, and then how do we, I'm sure there's a data-driven process on these specific sites. There is. But, but um, can you speak to like how we determine, the county's huge, right? So how do we determine exactly like where we would put a permanent site? Like is there... A so I, I, I guess I can speak to it to a, to a point. I mean, Joe Merrick and his group essentially are the ones that review. He's our traffic um, engineer for the county. Um, and essentially what they do is they look at various data sources. So they may look at crash history um, in certain areas. They may look at geograph or um, um, a design of the roadway if there are corners in certain areas to reduce speeds. Um, they may look at speeding history. Um, a variety of those data sets are what they kind of, they, they take that data and they push that data through different, different software to determine and prioritize the placement of these signs throughout the county. Um, and essentially that's that data driven process they're looking at. Um, Stafford Road has historically been, I mean, um, I believe you live that kind of out in that area. Yep. And yeah, and so um, we've historically had um, issues with, um, with speeding speed on that roadway, um, uh, volume and capacity of traffic on that roadway because we have issues with cut through traffic from I-5 to 205. Um, and so this is a, one of a number of different safety improvements we're looking to kind of advance on, on that roadway as a whole. Um, 282nd is kind of in the same boat. Um, it kind of gets a lot of, it's um, a lot of cut, cut through traffic and kind of East Multnomah, et cetera, folks going through and, and, and um, heading either east or west along that corridor as well. So, but there is a data-driven process, and I'd be glad to provide more information if you're looking for that. Um, so these are just, this is a visual reminder to the driver to say, hey, we're gonna nudge you here, saying you're going a little too fast. That is correct. Just so you know. They are simply a lit sign that basically reminds people of the speed in which they are going. Um, we do not, uh, there is currently, we do not have any photo, photo radar, radar yeah. within, within an incorporated Clackamas County whatsoever. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Scholl. Yes, Dan, this uh, six signs, six locations, they come out to $58,000 and change per sign. Does, is all that installation or is it part of that maintenance? It, it is it primarily, I'd have to go back and look at the contract in its totality, but I believe the majority of it is, yeah. is design and installation. And so essentially when you think about the placement of these signs, they, um, we tend to not use solar signs um, because they're reliability. Um, so essentially you have conduit, you have trenching, you have running of electricity, you have place, I mean, all you're seeing is the sign itself, but it's the utilities and the yeah. connections that go into that as well. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Commissioner Savas? Yeah, well, if these are permanent, I'm all for it. Yeah. Big time, I think it's really great. But I did want to just share that an experience I had, I forgot where I was, it may have been Washington State, in which I saw one of these signs and it was, the, it flashed yellow when you were close to the speed limit or slightly above it. And if you went faster than that, because a car zinged red. by me, it, went, it goes red. Yeah. It was like, wow, yeah. very impactful. So yeah, these are these are permanent. I'm excited. Yeah, I believe they are permanent. I'll con if, they, if not, I'll confirm with the board though as a whole. Um, and in regards to design, I'd have to go talk to Joe about that to see if they are because they have one of those. For example, some on the periphery of Happy Valley, et cetera, where yeah, that red flash comes up if you're speeding it over the line over the speed limit. Yep, there's one in Oregon City too. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay, seeing no further objections, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Next, Health, Housing, Human Services. Item one, approval of a financial assistance application life cycle form authorizing the Behavioral Health Division to apply for Behavioral Health State, Bill, State House Bill 2949 Workforce Incentive Funds. Anticipated grant award is approximately $474,987 for four years. Funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. Rod Cook, Director of Health, Housing, Human Services. Go ahead. Happy New Year, Commissioners. Um, this funding, if, if uh, approved, will be um, allocated for Clackamas County for clinical supervision. Uh, the program goals include uh, increased access to peer and community-driven programs that are culturally unique and sensitive for people of color, tribal groups, and those with behavioral health experience. Uh, it will also increase the number of people entering the training, entering and training in the behavioral health field and increase recruitment and retention. And lastly, uh, provide supervised clinical experience to associates or people with the right education but need supervised clinical ex experience to get licensed to practice. So this is basically helping the workforce um, move closer into becoming licensed and clinical So, because there's a shortage overall in, in the workforce. Well, there certainly is. And you mentioned peer support on this. Are we licensing people? Uh, who were peers, volunteers, and then went to... We're providing the hours for that, and they get licensed through the state. Through the state, absolutely. Yes. Commissioner uh, West. Uh, is this continuing education or practicum hours for students to get their degree? I don't know the specifics, but I could, I could find that out. But it sounds like it's... Um, uh, let me find out. Okay. I can Thank you. Yeah. See no further objections. Thank you very much. Item two, approval of an intergovernmental agreement with South Metro Area Regional Transit for Transportation Services. Agreement value is $142,140 for six months. Funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. Yes, if approved, this would uh, provide on-demand transportation services uh, <laughs> specifically designed for residents living at the Villabois Community uh, Housing Site. Commissioner mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Scholl. So this money is going to be you build out per ride. So the total amount might not be required. Is that correct? I'm not sure on the payment structure um, because if it was built out per ride, I, I'm not. I'm sure, I'm thinking. I don't think it's per a per ride deal. But I'd have to check um, on the funding structure of it. It's just that's, that's the total amount available. Um, I can say that much, but I'd have to get back to you on if that's a per ride. Okay. Commissioner Savas. Yeah, so I'm just looking at this. Um, I, I'm a little bit puzzled, and I just want to get further information, because South Metro Regional Transit, I thought, was, unless it's something else, maybe, maybe Commissioner West knows more, but SMART is the transit agency out in Wilsonville area, but South Metro, I know as being the Malala Transit Service, Malala, but we're talking Villa Bois. So uh, does, can you clarify, is this, is this the same South Metro or South, or, or South, is it South Metro or is it South Clackamas? It's, it's South. South Metro, I believe, <clears throat> is Wilsonville and Malala is just South. So there's, there's SMART, like, Commissioner right. Savas says, and then there's the West, which is at the transit center that goes into the Portland area at the train. I'm not familiar with South Metro Area Regional Transit within Wilsonville. I, I'm not either. So I'm this either. this is SMART. S M A R T is the South Metro Area Regional Transit. This is SMART in Wilsonville. Okay, so it's the acronym then. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so the, we always just say SMART. We just spelled it out the acronym. That's all. Okay. okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Yair. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Rod. Seeing no further objections. Okay, item three, approval of a revenue agreement with CARE Oregon for the staff trainings and pipeline investment project. The agreement value is $153,100 for one year. Funding is through CARE Oregon. No county general funds are involved. Yes, uh, this is uh, for training and it will empower the health center team with real-time um, actionable dashboards. It will help standard, uh, standardize their quality methods, build their capacity by making a book of tools everyone can use and encourage the growth of continuous quality improvement. So basically, this is another training grant that we're getting to um, enhance our staff. Great. Questions or comments? Yeah, just one. Is, is, is CARE Oregon a CCO? Yes. yes. Okay. So I, I have a 
I have a qu opportunity here, really, really the last one, not the last one, but this first one about the uh, behavioral health aspects. And when I first actually talked to um, then counselor, are you still a counselor? City Council? No, I, 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 I am not. I am only a commissioner now. So yeah. the, the very first phone call I ever got a couple, three years ago from uh, Councillor West, City of Wilsonville Councillor, was about trying to build a behavioral health facility out in the Wilsonville area. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, he was lobbying for that. And the time, of course, we know we've got a shortage of behavioral health services and beds in the state and in this region. And I'm just wondering if there is an opportunity, uh, is, is the CCOs um, resistant to expanding behavioral health services? Is that, is that, is, is that the challenge here? Um, I, my perspective, I wouldn't say that at all. I think they're very supportive and they are actually working with us to bring services to Clackamas County, not a, not a center, but uh, other behavioral health services. They're granting us funds to do that work. So let me ask you this then. So if there is a person on the street who needs to have um, behavioral health treatment, and let's just say it's a, a one-week stay, he's perhaps ideally, let's just say, would the CCO provide that service? So remember, CCOs have membership. And so they're going to work with their membership first, and that might be an eligibility criteria. However, they're, they're helping, they're funding things like that for us so that um, we have capacity to be in existence and to provide services to the broader population. So I know it sounds like I'm talking in circles here, but they care about their membership, if I could say it bluntly, uh, but because they give us the capacity to exist and have those services, we can uh, help those types of folks on the streets. Yeah, I'll, I'll be leaning on Commissioner West, perhaps in that area, for at least his support and help to better understand how that relationship is and how it builds capacity. I'm all for that. I just want to make sure there's no impediments along the way. Yeah, there's some opportunities with HealthShare, Care Oregon, a lot of the CCOs. I think there's some great uh, opportunities coming uh, in the near future. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. Commissioner Schrader. Yeah, so I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner West about this because um, I know that there was a lobbyist, Molly, mm -hmm. who'd been working on that. Yeah. Is the real holdup is that it's a privately run piece or you couldn't get through the the system analysis that <laughs> we are jumping right yep. in on my first day, aren't we? Um, you know, I, I love this conversation, but I don't believe Gary, this is the time or the place for no, it. And okay. I think oh. these questions need to be answered privately. And then when the time is right for us to have a session on it, that's what we need to do. Okay. So I'll have a meeting. Commissioner with, yeah. West, you're in the West. queue. Yeah. I, I, this is an issue that I've been super passionate about. Um, there are opportunities with the CCOs. We just um, redid the tenure. The state just worked and read with, okay. with, um, for CCOs. All of the kind of new services and agreements that we have are, are, are coming down the pike right now. And there are some new things that we can do to help with behavioral services and housing and things like that. Um, the, the issue with universal health systems um, and why that has been obstructed through protectionism um, and blockage to the state and the governor's office not stepping up and um, uh, giving a need certificate for over 100 psychiatric beds and mental health services um, is a long conversation that I think even as a county we should be engaged in. Um, but yeah, I think it's important that we do have that conversation. Maybe it's not right now, yeah. uh, but I would love to, like whatever I know and my experience has been, um, I'd love to download that and okay. tell the rest of you commissioners about it. Okay. Thank you very much. I think it's an important project going forward. Um, see no objections to this, thank you. Item four, approval of a low income household water assistance program agreement with the city of Gladstone for reimbursement of water and wastewater services on behalf of low income households. The agreement value not to exceed $840,019 allocated to the low income household water assistance program. Funding is through the Oregon Department of Housing and Community Services. No county general funds are involved. Uh, this one always raises questions because of the $840 figure. That's, that's the total amount. You're going to see several of these with several cities. Eight, 840 is the total amount that, that may be gathered. So, but this particular one allows uh, the city of Gladstone, its agreement with the city of Gladstone allows us to assist low-income households by paying for drinking water and waste removal costs on their behalf preventing shutoffs and supporting household water system reconnections due to non-payment. 
So again, the 840 is all the cities combined, but the way we write the contracts, it's an up to amount. Yeah, we approved this already on some On of several cities. other cities, yes. Any further questions on this? See, no objections. Item five, approval of a low income household water assistance program agreement with the city of Oregon City for reimbursement of water and wastewater services on behalf of low income households. Agreement value not to exceed $840,019 allocated to the low income household water assistance program. Funding is through the Oregon Department of Housing and Community Services. No county general funds are involved. This is identical to the previous item. Thank you, any questions? See no objections. Item six, approval of an amendment to a cooperative cooperation agreement with Clackamas County Children's Commission for the Estacada Head Start Improvements Project. The amendment value is $160,000. The total agreement value is increased to $300,000. Funding is through federal community development block grant funds. No county general funds are involved. Uh, this amendment adds 160000 to the original contract with Clacko Kids for building improvement to a community preschool in Estacada. Uh, these building improvements will ensure that the property meets ADA standards for ac accessibility for disabled people. Uh, the way we do our CBDG grants, you know, they're in a three-year cycle. So when this first came to us, it was a certain price points that were used. And now we are into the second year and you see the um, additional costs that's, that are needed. Thank you. Questions or comments? <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. Go. In addition to the ADA improvements for this project, uh, are there other <coughs> safety elements to the project to increase safety for the children? Uh, I believe when they, I've been in that particular building and it's a really old structure. And so I believe that they are going throughout that building and upgrading it uh, so it's safer for the children and the families. Who okay. Go there. <coughs> See no objections. Thank you. Item seven, approval of an amendment to a revenue intergovernmental agreement grant from the Oregon Department of Housing and Community Services to add low income household energy assistance funding. The agreement value is $6,349,405. The total agreement value is increased to $38,096,432. Funding is through the Oregon Department of Housing and Community Services. No county general funds are involved. Yeah, we're seeing this opportunity because additional funds um, from the U.S. Department of Energy were granted to Oregon Housing and Community Services to improve energy efficiency among low-income people in Oregon lowering their overall residential energy costs and boosting their health and safety in process. So this is just our portion of that additional piece that came to Oregon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Oh, Commissioner Scholl. Uh, of the 38 million, how much has been dispersed to date? And what's the period of time that this extends into the future to cover this? Or, let me restate the question, how much of the $38 million is left over? I'll have to get back to you on that. I don't, I don't okay. have that. I, I asked the question because I, uh, you know, things are getting more expensive all the time, so I see a, a growing need and not a waning <clears throat> need on this money. Yeah, and I know there's a time limit on those, but we'll get you the specifics on that and where we are in our spending. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions or comments? Seeing no objections. Item eight, approval of a local subrecipient grant agreement with Project Quest for non-opioid pain management services. The agreement <laughs> value is $345,000 for 23 months. Funding is through the Oregon Health Authority. No county general funds are involved. So a national health emergency was declared after two decades of rising prescription and non-prescription opioid use and overdose deaths. Uh, I have a lot of statistics here, but I won't read those, but I will say um, basically this model uses wellness, integrity, and sustainable health, it's called WISH is the acronym, in an integrated medical and behavioral health program designed to treat chronic pain through non-opioid interventions. The program integrates acupuncture, yoga, mental health, medication management, treatment for substance abuse disorder, nutrition, and peer support in a community setting. So it's basically trying to get the system off of going straight to opioid use to, to handle pain. Thank you very much for doing this. Questions or comments? <clears throat> See, no, Commissioner West. 
Um, <clears throat> where, where is the money? Does it go to pra specific practitioners? Is it through specific plans? Like, where does the money? It's a small amount of money, but where is the money kind of um, divvied and delegated to where it gets to the patient? Yeah, I'm not seeing that in my notes, but we can get that to you. Um, I know we have some pretty a, a pretty quality written. Um, Process that uh, Dr. Shiitake uses, but that's with our jail inmates. So I have to see which, which, where this is going. But we I, can get you that. I'd specific be curious question. how the funds or a program like this um, uh, distill down to the actual the patient in the community or the patient wherever they are at, and where are those patients? And um, is it focused more towards a certain subset of population that has this that, that has this need? Um, like, is it in the primarily within the correctional facility? Is it you know somebody on the streets that needs additional support? This this stuff is really cutting edge um, and really important as we deal with the opioid epidemic. Um, uh, I've seen it in my own practice, so this is really important work. I just be very curious about how that program is implemented and how those funds distribute actually the resources to the patient. <clears throat> I'd love to get that to you. Oops. Thank you. Commissioner West. I turn this off because it's easy. Thank you. <laughs> These switches. It's a tracking system, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Seeing no further questions or comments and no objections. Thank you, Rod. All right, thank you. Thank you. Rod, so, Rod, the board has a lot of questions for you, and because of our schedule, the business meeting's tomorrow. So, can your staff answer all these <coughs> questions by 10 a.m. tomorrow? I believe so. Thank you. Yes. I see head nods in the back. Thank yeah, you. We, we have people listening to the questions and working them as, we, as they come out. Thank you. So, commissioners, all of these items will go on tomorrow, Thursday's business meeting agenda for your, your approval there. Today was just to tee that up, but tomorrow will be the consent request on your business meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Rod. Next item on the list, regional mobility pricing project, purpose and need, and proposed action comment letter. There was a memo in your packet, as well as a, a suggested edit by Commissioner Savas that was distributed to you at your dais today. Dan Johnson, Director of Transportation and Development, and Jamie Stasny, also from Transportation and Development. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, Dan. Thank oh, you. Oh, boy. <laughs> so uh, I am pleased to be up here with, with Jamie. We get the pleasure of sharing two topics that are near and dear to your heart. Uh, one is a discussion around the re uh, regional mobility pricing project, and then our second topic will be the UGB swap. Um, I want to make sure we're clear. We are here to request the board um, submit a letter that's in your packet, it's attachment C, okay? Um, these are comments that um, I wanna make sure we are clear with you are rooted in your tolling value statement. So that you'll, there's board, bold sections of that um, that raise um, questions and or comments that relate to that. Then secondly, there are more technical aspects which are underneath those various sections. This um, regional mobility pricing um, is different than, than the Section 129 tolling for Abernathy. Uh, this is the regional discussion we're having about that. So right now I'm going to hand it over to Jamie, um, who's going to do kind of give a little more background, a little more detail about this, and hopefully answer any questions you might have. So with that, I'll over. Thanks, Dan. Good morning, Chair Smith. Happy New Year, Commissioners, Administrator Schmidt. It's good to see you all. Um, back in front of you. Uh, fresh this year to talk about tolling. Um, so for a little bit of context, the Regional Mobility Pricing Program is what we're here to talk about today. This is different from the I-205 toll program. This is very confusing. As you all know, we've talked about it a lot. But we are here today because they are, ODOT is proposing to toll all of 205 from I-5 all the way up to the Glen Jackson Bridge, as well as all of I-5 from south of Wilsonville all the way up to the Washington border. This is called the Regional Mobility Pricing Program. You've known it was coming. They're getting ready to launch the EA process, and so that's why we're here, and that's why we're here today. The public comment period started a while back. It ends on the 6th. We need to get the comments in. So um, we're here today with your first opportunity to comment. There's going to be a lot more. So we'll be talking about this. But staff has reviewed all of the materials, and we've been working really hard to coordinate with our regional partners on this, all of our cities, kind of talking amongst ourselves. And we have drafted the attached letter. The letter uh, essentially covers six points. And as Dan said, kind of a high-level point that ties back to your values and then some technical detail under it. So I'll, I'm going to review those six points, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. 
So first is that the regional mobility pricing program that they're proposing is going to exacerbate diversion and rerouting. We all know this, we've talked about it. It's not really acknowledged in this purpose and need statement that we're being asked to comment on right now. There's a major focus on the interstate system, the improvements that will be seen on the interstate system very little mention of what's going to happen on the local systems. We need to bring that forward. So that first point is saying, we need to really talk about that in the statement. Second, the design of this system is critical and must be clearly studied. And this is really referring to where they place the gantries. It seems like a really technical point, but for example, if they were to place the gantries on the ramps instead of on the bridges, that may encourage people to actually stay on the interstate instead of getting off to pay the toll that part of the process wasn't public during the 205 project. They just kind of told us, hey, we're thinking about some of these things, this is what we're doing. And so this time we're saying, that needs to be part of the process, so that's number two. Number three is that revenue from congestion pricing or tolling will be spent both on and off the system. And they don't talk a lot about that, that they're going to mitigate the impacts and they're gonna use some of this revenue to do it. And so we wanna be very <coughs> clear about that. Number four, to actually achieve these improvements that they're saying they're going to get on air quality, we have to see a reduction of per capita VMT and hours traveled both on, and again, off the system. And we wanna see that evidence of that. So we call attention to that, uh, again, technical detail, but very important. Number five, and this one's tricky, but essentially, staff is recommending that they consider doing an environmental impact statement instead of an environmental assessment. Currently, ODOT is proposing an environmental assessment, which is a low, lower level approval from the FHWA. This is complicated. No one has ever done this before in this way. And to do a lower, lower level analysis does not make sense. They need to include analysis of all the different components, including how will the 205 toll program work with this? That's a segment of it. It should be looked at as a phase. They're not proposing to do that. So we are raising that issue with them. Number six. Don't toll 205 ahead of the rest of the region. The Clackamas County residents, business owners should not be asked to bear this burden, especially ahead of the rest of the region. And so they need to look at another way of um, doing this so that we're not asked to go first. So again, that's a point you've made over and over. We're reiterating it. Don't toll us first. We should be doing this all in one piece. I'm sure commissioners want to make a comment, Commissioner Savas, but I have a quick, quick question. What is the timing of this? Do we know? <clears throat> yes, so the schedule for in implementation would be tolling to begin in 2025 for the Regional Mobility Pricing Program, which is one year after they're targeting to begin tolling on 205 Got it. for the 205 toll pro pro Thank you program. for that clarification. Commissioner Savas, you're up. I'm not sure yeah, um, good job on the letter. Um, okay. Jamie, Dan, when we spoke yesterday, we were talking about making a small amendment, and staff, you guys helped with that, and it's before my colleagues on the dais here. Um, and it says on page three, added the first sentence. So you're suggesting on page three, um, before a variety of changes, where it says a variety of changes, where exactly do you want that amendment made or inserted? Uh, my suggestion was right before that sentence, okay. just to say why you want that done. Okay. I'm confused on which page three we're on. It's, a, it's the last page of the letter. Okay. It, uh, under okay, what? hang on a minute, Is just that, a minute. That would be C actually fifth? page five on, uh, on my computer screen. Correct. Right. Thank you. Yep. Yep. And um, this is a okay. Add to um, where again, Paul? Would that be added? So at the top of page three, it, it, on your computer, it will show right now. It starts with the words uh, a variety of changes. Mm. Okay, so it would be okay. before that, correct? It'd be the it'd be on. It'd be yeah. the opening sentence of the page. Correct. Okay. We are concerned, I'm going to read that for the record, we are, we are concerned that diversion caused by tolling program will add vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions on the local systems. Therefore, a variety of changes. Commissioners, is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll consider that, but there's two more commissioners in the queue. Uh, Commissioner Scholl. Yes. Uh, uh. Thanks for the letter. I agree with uh, Commissioner Savas's uh, recommended change. But I want to say <clears throat> something about I-205. I-205 at $750 million. 
If ODOT would look at their $5.3 billion budget for this year, strip out 2.85%, which is $150 million, and do that for five years, they could pay for this without tolling. There would be no diversion. Um, we have in the letter a sentence that states that we're not necessarily condoning the RMPP, correct? <clears throat> if any change I would make on that, I'd make that even more, uh, word it more, even more strongly. So page one of the letter? Yeah. I believe it's the second paragraph there before right. doing in bold. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's good. But again, um, I can't help but looking at the ODOT budget and seeing how this could be paid for without tolling I-205. It's 2.85% of the total ODOT budget for five years stripped out and is paid for. I don't know why ODOT's not, not looking at that. And I have, to, I have to believe that there is some other motivation for the funds off tolling other than just going back into transportation projects. I think it's, again, tolling on I-205 is something that I just cannot stomach. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you very much Shaw. for your time. Commissioner West. This is uh, my first opportunity to speak publicly as an elected about something I really, really care about. Um, this is a great letter. I don't disagree with any of it. Um, I appreciate this board's history um, on being vigilant for Clackamas County residents in the region on this horrific boondoggle of a policy. Um, this policy, when you distill it all the way down, is about behavioral management, and it's mean. It's just mean. It's cruel. Um, <clears throat> I wish our letter stated a little bit more about how this impacts the most vulnerable populations in the region that are already suffering with increased cost, inflation, um, and the inability to just get by every day and balance their own personal checkbooks. And then now we have pricing that could be as much as $160 per car in every single household. Um, we and we are always talking about, um, you guys have talked about this, but this is just and I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a soapbox, I guess, because I haven't had the chance to talk about this yet publicly, but um, I believe Clackamas County has to be a vanguard and a wall against this kind of bad policy. We, we have to be a firewall against it, um, and we have to be firm and principled in how we fight for our local community, and this is why we have local governments, is to represent our neighbors. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with the changes that were given to us today in the letter by Commissioner Savas. Um, I, uh, you know, we got also at a certain point just got to get a letter out. We can tweak this and modify it and, and, and do all kinds of, you know, additional, we could probably make it 10 pages if we wanted to. So we could have 10 points or affinity points. So, because there's so many reasons why, and, 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 and Commissioner Schultz completely right. This absolutely um, can be dealt with through additional funding sources. There are other creative ideas to actually um, deal with this in a way that's not hurting vulnerable populations, local businesses in the community in a way that's not mean spirited. And um, there's a lot of creativity out there. Unfortunately, the public process has been incredibly flawed throughout this whole entire thing. So I support the letter um, and the changes from Commissioner Savas. Thank you. The issues that you brought up, Commissioner West, are as far as equity. We have addressed many times in many different letters. It has not gone unnoticed. This will not be our last letter on mobility pricing or tolling or any other aspects of transportation systems. So there's more to come on that, and you'll get an opportunity. Here we go. And what I will do, I see no other commissioners in the queue. First, I will uh, accept a motion for the amendment uh, that Commissioner Savas has offered up, and then we will approve the letter. So move. Second. Seconded. Uh, Commissioner Schrader has moved to approve the amendment that states we are concerned that diversion caused by the tolling program will add vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse, greenhouse gas, GHG, emissions on the local system, therefore. And Commissioner Scholl has second that motion. Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Savas. Aye. 
Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Now I will accept a motion to uh, send a letter to proper authorities as amended. So move. Seconded. Commissioner Schrader has moved that we send the letter entitled, what is it, just a moment, just a moment, just a moment, let me look at my, mm -hmm. the Regional Mobility Pricing Project, Purpose and Need and Proposed <coughs> Action for NEPA Analysis Comments, and Commissioner Scholl has seconded that. Any further discussion? Uh, Chair, for sake of impact, I would uh, respectfully request we all sign the letter. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, not a problem. We all have electronic signatures, correct? Mm -hmm. I do. We will. You will. We yes. will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Um, any further discussions? Tony, please take the poll. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Zavis. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye. Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, staff, for your very good work on this. Uh, this is not the last statement that we're making, and we appreciate your issue spotting and watching this diligently for us. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Next item, Metro Urban Growth Boundary Exchange Open Houses. Dan and Jamie will also present on this topic. There was a memo in your packet. Go ahead, please. You're day two, right? I, I love being these lovely topics. <laughs> this is great. Day two. <laughs> um, so this is just for your information, um, and I'm going to give a little bit of background. Um, I'll, I'll, you've been tracking this, uh, but just for sake of discussion, uh, City of Tigard submitted a request for a mid-cycle urban growth boundary um, amendment to add approximately uh, 500 acres of land to the UGB. Uh, Metro COO um, recommended uh, considering a land exchange, um, basically removing undeveloped land and replacing it with this developable land. In late November, uh, the council directed, um, and there were three options that were put forward, essentially options um, one and two, removed large por portions of Damascus, easterly portions of Damascus. Option three removed a smaller portion of Damascus from the UGB and an area in Oregon City. Um, in November, um, Metro Council um, essentially gave the green light for consideration of the option three, okay? Notice has been sent now, as required by the state, to all those property owners, um, which was a concern the board had, the interaction that Metro was having specifically with the property owners. That notice has been sent. And we are in, uh, just here to basically make sure the board knows that one, there are two open houses that are coming up. They're in your materials. One is tonight at the Clackamas Community um, Facility over off Harmony Road. It's in person. And the second is a virtual one, which is Thursday. I wanted to make sure you were uh, informed of that. And then um, advising uh, the board that uh, right now we are assuming Metro will be holding a public hearing on January 19th um, and is expected to take action on February 2nd. Um, and so I uh, also wanted to inform the board that staff is ready, willing, and able should um, the board like to submit additional testimony, written or verbal, uh, during that public hearing process. Uh, I will remind the board, um, obviously we have sent comments to Metro. Uh, November 2nd, uh, the Metro or the Board of County Commissioners approved sending a letter directly to Metro. And November 9th, we received a response from Metro. Um, so I want to make sure that was on the record that we had submitted comments to date, uh, raising concerns and objections um, to the process and the removal of those areas. So um, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Again, this is mostly informative. Um, and we stand here to support the board any way we see, you see fit. OK, so thank you for that, Dan. Now, regarding these uh, meetings, these town hall meetings, on tonight and tomorrow, the meetings are the same, correct? Mm -hmm. The same information, the same topic? Cor they are open houses, so questions may arise which may be different, but the presentation is expected to be the same. Okay, That's correct. So for tonight's meeting, there is no virtual, there is no Zoom. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. I believe that to be the case. Yep. Commissioners, I, I'm, I am not able to attend tonight's meeting, but I do intend mm -hmm. on attending the Thursday meeting virtually. <coughs> and if there's public comment, I will be making public comments. So staff, please prepare something. Now, I would like to know what the other commissioners would like to do regarding this. Commissioner Savas, you're up. Yeah, I just have a question. I know you don't, you're not going to have the answer, but it, maybe we could find a way to get the answer. And that is the key thing I really 
my takeaway in reading this last night, and you said it, is that they're, they're targeting developable land for developable land, right? Taking out developable acreage, not just acreage. So I think that's a distinction that draws attention, the, the assessed value potential of developable land. So I'd just like to get a rough idea on a per acre basis of developable land for housing, what the assessed value is, to put a price tag on what that would add to the annual um, tax revenue for Clackamas County. Um, and that's a, probably something for tax, taxation assessment to do, but I just like a rough number um, because the key thing here is this is not just land, it's developable land. So they're literally, this is, this is really taking away in, in the future, in the near future, um, really tax revenue and it's, this is a change. This is a take. We may not have the answers to that this week, I understand, but is there into you any way to quantify this? Dan. There's a way to estimate it, and exactly. so basically, if you were gonna, if you were looking, I mean, in, taking, taking all the the net, taking all the development costs away, and simply looking at it at a at a section of land, an acreage area of land, and assuming a certain percentage is residential or commercial or industrial, and then assuming a development and a rate associated with that, it, it, we can give you a, a, a you know. A wag. Well, not um, a development rate. Well, just what would be the raw cost? I mean, just the raw value of bare land if it was zoned industrial or if it was zoned residential. I think that's what Commissioner Savas well, is asking. Well, actually, actually, it's not the bare land. It's it's the assessed value of what. Let, let's just take the Tiger proposal out on Tiger. When that's built out, what assessed value will be added? What tax revenue will be added? You know, most of the assessed value and the, and the, yeah, the assessed value. And then what's that do for the general fund of Washington County? And that's because that's going to be realized. And then that would be dollars that wouldn't be realized at some point in time in the future in Clackamas County, probably farther out. But, but I'm just trying to get an idea of what that means in tax revenue, knowing so, that we have some serious financial constraints uh, paying for the courthouse for the next 30 years, by the way. Let us put some thought to that. I think the assessor can help you, uh, Dan. Yep, yep, yep. Yep. Commissioner Schrader. Well said, Commissioner Savas. Um, I think that's excellent information that we need to have. Um, my sense is, for example, I don't have any objection to uh, Tigard building more housing. I don't think that's the issue. The issue is what do we get in exchange for that? Because they are removing land from our tax base. So I think that's the crux of the matter. Uh, no one is against, uh, I can't speak for the whole commission, but I'm pretty sure we're all in alignment with this, about uh, housing development in an area where they have it ready, shovel ready, ready to go, so on and so forth. However, uh, leaving us shortchanged without looking at additional land uh, for industrial development, more housing, so on, and so, forth, so on and so forth for our tax base is something that I think we have to continue to make an issue, uh, an issue of. So um, just wanted to state that. Thank you. Thank you. And two, um, Clackamas County is really a donor county for the prosperity of another jurisdiction, and that's not acceptable. And that's what I'm going to attend on saying. And if you, commissioners, if you would look in today's Newscom article. Uh, I made that statement. Lynn Peterson counted it in the newspaper. We will be making, I will be making more statements regarding this. We need to be compensated, period, either in terms of dollars or in terms of we get a select where those additional 500 acres of developable land gets to appear within Clackamas County border. It's very simple. And the statements tomorrow night from me will reflect that. Commissioner um, West. <coughs> I mean, maybe I'm a, a maybe I'm a brand new neophyte, but why can't Tiger build and we build? Like, why can't the UGB just be um, a little more modernized and allow us to deal with housing issues in the metro area and stop yeah. these artificial lines that basically hurt um, our constituents? This is, um, uh, you know. I, there's plenty of land to be built on, and no one's suggesting we're become sprawling Denver or LA. But th these these little squabbles are counterproductive, and they don't actually benefit our constituents. Uh, 
I would agree. Commissioner Schrader, you're up. Yeah, I just also want to mention that I do know the development community um, uh, has indicated, I think, to us on more than one occasion that they understand that they also believe that we should not be shortchanged yeah. um, with this uh, particular issue. And so we do have, ex you know, we do have champions uh, in the community, in the business community, and development community that will, I hope, will help us get that message across. You, Thank you, Commissioner Schrader. Now, commissioners, um, is, does anybody want to attend tonight's meeting? It's not necessary. It's not part of whatever we need to do. I will attend uh, tomorrow night virtually. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll be there. Okay, Paul, thank you. And I would love to be there, but I'll be in Welch's for the CPO meeting this afternoon. Oh, yeah, that's important, too. I'll be, I'll, I'll be there. I'll go with Commissioner um, Savas. Okay. Yeah. That would be fine. Be mm -hmm. oh, so two and two. I think two and two is. Yeah, I'll go with you. I'll be on tomorrow night also. Okay. Yeah. Now, I, I don't have plans of speaking per se, yeah. uh, but just I just, up. yeah, I'm just going to be there to yeah. listen okay. in. I plan on representing what I believe the board uh, um, has already said regarding this issue, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think um, Commissioner mm -hmm. Schrader is right. I think we're pretty much all in general agreement on this. Yeah. <clears throat> Moving forward, thank you. I think that's all. Uh, so uh, staff will present talking points for all of you if you wish to use it, but certainly, <laughs> certainly for tomorrow night's uh, virtual meeting, January 19th, the Metro Council is having their first public hearing on this topic. Do you want a comment letter prepared for that meeting? Yes. Okay. Staff, would you please draft a draft and bring it back to issues next week, perhaps, or the week after? Do the week after. So we the can hear the comments. Perfect. That's perfect. Perfect. Yeah. We'll Thank draft you, a letter and bring it back to you before January 19th. Thank, Thank you, you, Dan. Thank you, Jamie Snazzy, so for much. your very fine work on this topic. All right, Very next topic, nice. advisory boards and commission appointments. Tony, go ahead. The Library District Advisory Council, City of Estacada is requesting the appointment of a new member to the council as a result of a, a resignation. That new member nomination is Des Desiree Dumestru. Thank you, Tony. I will entertain a motion. I move the approval of the appointment. Second. Commissioner Savas has moved for the appointment of the library district of Desiree Dimenescu. Commissioner Schrader has seconded that motion. Any further discussions? Seeing none, Tony, please kick the poll. Commissioner West. Aye. Commissioner Scholl. Aye. Commissioner Schrader. Aye. Commissioner Savas. Aye. Chair Smith. Aye, motion passes 5-0. Thank you. Next topic, your business meeting agenda review for this Thursday, tomorrow, January 5th, 2023. You will have all the consent agenda requests that you reviewed at today's meeting. You'll have public communication, of course, and you'll have a board discussion item on the selection of a vice chair. This is what you do, their first business meeting of every two years, odd years, which would be this year. The, the vice chair role is rotated among the four commissioners and the main role of the vice chair is to serve in the absence of the chair. So this Thursday, you'll have a discussion and make an appointment uh, for the 2023 vice chair. Actually do it every year, I'm sorry. It happens every calendar year, the first Thursday, the first business meeting of every calendar year, you appoint a, voice cha a vice chair. If you have any questions on any topics, please let me know. I'm happy to answer them before tomorrow's meeting. Next topic, uh, board evening business meetings. You had, uh, Chair, you had said that you were willing to go back to evening business meetings for this board starting in 2023. Wanted to confirm if the board agrees with that and which week of the month you would like to do that. In the past, you did that on the second Thursday of each month. You'd have an evening business meeting at 6 p.m. Do you want to continue that or pick a different week of the month? I believe... Staff has looked at commissioner's schedules, and Emily told me she thought that the second Thursday of the month worked best for meetings. Now, is that? That's work? good. I, I think it works yeah. for you, Paul. Yeah, trust staff that did the homework, yeah. so. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so as far as I know, we can reconvene <coughs> those monthly evening business meetings. Do I need a motion for that, Gary? You don't need a motion. Uh, would you like to start this month, which would mean next week? Next Thursday, January 12th, is the second That's Thursday, great. so that would be an uh, evening meeting. No. No. February? <laughs> yeah. No. So start in February? February. February. I think there's consensus for February. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
Great. We'll start the month of February. The second Thursday of each month will be an evening business meeting, 6 p.m. We'll get notice out. Okay. That's Thank fine you. with me. Very uh, fine. The final item today is Commissioner Communications. Chair Smith. Well, for the new year, who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Scholl, you're up. Yes. Uh, thank you. I, I had a really nice uh, time yesterday at the 2023 Metro Council swearing-in ceremony. I tell you what, it was a very nice group of people. I met everybody. I talked to all the new elected councilors, um, the new uh, President um, Peterson, Councilor Simpson, Councilor Lewis, Councilor Gonzalez, Councilor Wang, and also the new elected Auditor Brian Evans. Uh, I really enjoyed that interaction. Also, this afternoon I'll be in Welch's to meet with the Hoodland CPO. They want to talk about short-term rentals. And then next week I have to go back to a public meeting with them on the same topic on 11 January. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Scholl. Commissioner Schrader. Well, Happy New Year, everybody. It's great to be back. I had a lovely Christmas with my family, see my grandbabies. Um, they're just beautiful children, and I'm uh, so grateful I had the opportunity. Uh, I will tell you, though, uh, traveling in the, the transportation system there, oops, you're you're on. Traveling the transportation system in Massachusetts was quite the experience. I took a three-hour drive from Boston to New York to visit my 90-year-old aunt and my cousins. And the Merritt Parkway was bumper to bumper in pouring rain with no lights. And I had forgotten how bad that is. <laughs> So it was a little bit tense driving in that weather. And uh, despite the issues we have here with transportation, uh, I'm really glad I'm living on the West Coast with the systems we have here. I think they're much easier to navigate. Uh, they're well maintained. And uh, uh, again, I, I had forgotten what it was like to drive in the dark uh, with no lights, with bumper to bumper traffic as I went to Porchester, New York, my hometown. But one of the other things I'd like to talk about in the new year is one of the things uh, hopefully I'll be working on uh, with the support uh, of the board, and that is economic mobility. And what is economic mobility? It's the ability of folks to uh, increase their, their economic status over the course of their lifetimes. It requires access to things like income, uh, training, employment, but also intangible resources like authority and power, the ability to make choices for yourself and influence other, others, and also social inclusion. So um, I'm a member of a cohort that I will be starting uh, to visit with next week, the Economic Mobility Leadership Network. It is a grant uh, from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it is a cohort of commissioners across the United States that is actually looking at different areas of the country. Uh, this coming week, it'll be in Mobile, Alabama. And I will get a chance to do that and be here virtually as necessary. Uh, but what we look at is to see what the strategies are that are working in various areas of this country that move people up the economic ladder. And uh, I think that I hope to bring back as we really start to rev up our economic development uh, uh, unit that we have here in this county under Gary's direction, what are those strategies? How can we implement them? And how we can help move people out of poverty into housing and prosperity? I think that's a big issue for all of us. And I hope to come back with tangible ideas, not just pie in the sky. Let's just talk about, oh, how do we do it? I want to come up with, with uh, actual ways to make this happen. Um, so I'm excited about that. Um, I would like to make sure that I also send all of you all the information I get from those meetings so you get to read it. And they also, the other group I am uh, heavily involved in, I'm the chair of the uh, economic development and workforce at the national level. So uh, I will be including what our uh, <laughs> needs are, not only uh, at the national level with the policies that we are pushing forward with the rest of the counties that I'll be working with. I hope that I get some support. I know I will, Gary. 
from the folks, uh, our PGA folks, as I review what NACO is pushing forward nationally and how it aligns with what we need to be doing here at our county. And the reason I think this impo is important is this. We would not have gotten ARPA money directly to counties if it hadn't been for the National Association of Counties. And I will say that one of the things that helped, I don't know if many people know this, but President Joe Biden started out as a county commissioner. And one of the things the executive director mentioned was when he was giving the speech about ARPA, counties were not included in it. So he talked about cities and state, and then he stopped. And he was silent for a minute, and he looked at it. And then he added, and counties. So our influence at this level, uh, I think, is pretty important for us to get our needs met. And Commissioner um, <clears throat> Smith, I know you're going to talk about some of the dollars that we recently got, I think, for two projects. I think one was for boring, and the other one was for... It was, it was federal dollars that we got, and NACO actually called me in order to call our delegation, uh, which I did, uh, to say, hey, we need this money, and you have worked very hard on this with me. We went there together and make yeah. that happen. You did. Thank so you very you, much. So mention that, please. Okay. Very good. Um, Commissioner Savas, you're up. Sure. Um, I did want to just touch on something that occurred at a meeting that occurred uh, in December. Uh, it was our, our um, C4 Diversion Tolling Committee, uh, basically. And it's basically a meeting that is somewhat staffed by ODOT. But it was our first meeting where we went from the lunch hour, a one-hour meeting, to a two-hour meeting. And uh, towards the tail end of that meeting, and it's recorded, um, if anyone wanted to reference it, but I asked one of the ODOT staff members who had done some of the tolling analysis, the traffic analysis, uh, asked him, are we, are we doing the traffic analysis on diversion only at peak hour, or are we also looking at other busy hours of the day, the, week, the weekday? And his answer was, only the peak hour. I go, so how do you assess, how do you accurately assess then um, how those diversion impacts will affect the businesses, for example, like on Main Street in Oregon City? On, the, on Willamette Falls Drive uh, and or Highway 43, for example, when people are diverting 24-7 because the people, the people divert today uh, during, because of and during rush hour traffic because of that bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. That's their incentive to divert. We are now shifting that to something that's going to be economic. They're going to be penalized for driving down the freeway, so they're going to look to divert. And that's, I think that is the common sense part of, I don't think that ODOT un understands what people's behaviors will be. This is behavior change, essentially. They even said, they even stated that. But I'm very concerned about what that does for the businesses. Now, for those of you who know Oregon City and Main Street, in the afternoon, um, early evening, four o'clock, five o'clock, um, whether it's a Saturday or a Sunday or some busy times, just imagine more traffic on Main Street, Alignment Falls Drive, that's not peak hour. Right. And they're not assessing that. That's not part of the oh. study. It's not part of the NEPA. It's not part of ODOT's due diligence. And I raised that. I said, I, I'm, I'm taking, that was a memorable moment for me. I just want to make sure you were all aware that the study analysis is not as great a detail and thoughtful as one might think. Yep. Of course That's, that's what I have for today. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Commissioner West. <clears throat> <clears throat> well, I don't have a ton because, well, it's my first day, really. <laughs> um, I, uh, I, I guess I'll take a moment. I just want to thank my, my hometown and community for allowing me to serve as their city councilor for the last four years. Um, my family and I moved from North Portland to Clackamas County in Wilsonville in 2014 because we were looking for a different and better opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of migration happens around the world because people are looking for opportunity, right? And for us, we just needed to go 30 minutes uh, uh, s south, 
on I-5, and we found a great community there. So it was a, uh, an honor of my lifetime to serve as a city councilor with my, and, and to support my neighbors. I learned a lot. You get to cut your teeth and figure out how public policy works in local government and all the glamorous things we get to talk about. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed that. And then now I'm really, really excited to serve as a county commissioner. Um, everybody in the county within my first 48 hours has been incredibly welcoming. Uh, many of you behind the scenes have already, I would say, begin to mentor me and help me make sure that I'm successful. I feel that um, when I'm around you guys, there's a great cohesiveness, and I really, really look forward to working with the four of you, and I think that we can do some really amazing things. So um, next time, I might have something more interesting to report. We had a great holiday, too, um, and I uh, had everybody over for Christmas and um, spent time with my friends over the New Year's, that, and here we are ready to get back to work and do some big things in 2023. So um, thank you to all of the staff who's already been professional and welcoming and wonderful. Um, you guys make our jobs a lot easier. So Gary, thank you to you and your staff already. And um, yeah, I look forward to getting to work with you guys. Thank you very much. Yes, um, we're still cleaning up on a lot of opportunities and issues and uh, conflicts from last year. We'll be working on those as we move forward. Um, we are, um, are the recipients of a lot of money from the federal government. And how we spend that money, I think, is really incumbent on our value system. We have established value systems, and as we move forward with goal setting for the next year, I want to work on uh, more values in each of the key areas. I'd also like to focus on core county services regarding our budget and spending. I would also like uh, to oppose unfunded mandates, partially funded mandates that are going to the counties. Legislators, you know, just can't help themselves. They forget that we have shared <laughs> constituencies. They go down to Salem and forget that counties run the areas that they represent. And they will pass bills, and they will pass this, and they'll throw a few hundred thousand dollars at it or several millions, but thinking that the counties have deep pockets. As we go forward, everybody's feeling the pinch. And as we do our legislative agenda starting next week, commissioners, um, we really need to be mindful of what we're telling the legislatures to do on that. Uh, yes, Commissioner Schrader did mention that um, uh, we were the recipients of some federal money that we have been working on very hard. Gary, you remember what those totals are? Yes, uh, so we received uh, $4 million for the Hillside Manor Housing Project in Clackamas County and $2 million for the Boring Lagoon Wastewater Improvements. And that's very important. The Hillside Manor project in Milwaukee is an issue that was a hot topic when I was a commissioner back in uh, 2013, 14, 15, and you know, throughout that, and it's finally coming to fruition where we got approval from HUD, the federal government, to um, revitalize that housing and redo it because there's a massive amount of land <coughs> and we can add more housing uh, to that. It's one of the oldest housing um, projects in the entire state of Oregon. And just as a reminder, Clackamas County has the oldest housing authority in the entire state of Oregon. So we will continue on those veins. Um, commissioners, thank you very much for your good work today. Hearing no other business before this board, we are adjourned.